basic dog anatomy and breeds. This is another dog skeleton lesson to help you learn more about and understand your dog. As you learn more about dogs and more about the individual breeds, you'll learn that the way they are built is crucial to what they can do and how they look. It is also important to know some basic anatomy so that if there is a problem with your dog, you can describe it to your veterinarian. Let's look at some of the dog's anatomy. This would be the external anatomy. We'll start at the top where the dog's ears are and work our way around. So coming down from the ears, you'll see something called the crest. This is the back of the neck. Moving down to the withers. The withers would be the tallest part on your dog's back. This is where the shoulder blades come up. Then you have the back, the hip, and the loin, moving to the point of the rump, or the point of the rear of the dog. Looking at the dog's rear legs, you'll see the stifle, or the knee, and then the tarsus, or the hock. And the hock is more like our ankle bone. Moving down, you see the metatarsus, and then the digits, or the toes. The underside of the dog's stomach there would be called the brisket. And moving from the front chest down, you'll see the shoulder, the point of the shoulder, the elbow, the forearm, the carpus, or the wrist, and then the metacarpus, or the pastern. Around the dog's head, you see the skull, the stop, which is the area there coming between the eyes, the dog's muzzle, the lips, the flu, and the cheek. So it would be important to kind of get your dog and look and see how these parts match up to your own animal. It doesn't matter what breed of dog you have or what size or shape, the parts are still the same. Here is just another picture to show you on a different sized dog that the parts are still the same as we move around the animal. Let's look at the skeletal structure of your dog. What's very interesting is dogs, other mammals, and even humans, we all have many of the same skeletal features. So once again, let's start at the top of our dog and move our way around. There at the top, you'll see the skull, and in the front of it, you'll have the eye sockets, also called the orbits. And then you'll see towards the back of the skull, the occiput. This is a place that we have on our skull as well. If you take your hand and feel the back of your skull, you'll feel like kind of a little bump. That's your occipital part of your skull. Moving down to the neck, you'll see the atlas and the axis. These vertebrae are sometimes called the yes-no axis and atlas. These are the vertebrae that help us and other animals to put our heads up and down and shake our heads side to side. The vertebrae in the neck are called the cervical vertebrae. This is the same name for the vertebrae in our necks. Moving down, you'll see the vertebrae where the ribs are attached. These are called the thoracic vertebrae. Our vertebrae where our ribs are attached are also called thoracic vertebrae. Then you'll see the lower back of the dog, and these are the lumbar vertebrae. In your lower back, you have the lumbar vertebrae as well. And we know that many chairs and even sometimes in our vehicles, we'll have lumbar support to help support our lower backs. Looking at the rear of the dog down the rear legs, you'll see the pelvis. We have a pelvis. This includes our hip bones. Moving down to the femur, which is like your thigh, a tibia and fibula, which are the bones in our lower leg. The hock, we know, is more like our ankle bones. And then the metatarsus are more like the long bones in our feet. Ribs, um, and then the shoulder blade or scapula, similar parts to humans. And then moving down the front legs, you'll see the humerus, also called the funny bone, down into the radius and ulna, which are the bones that connect our wrist to our elbow, the carpus, which is most similar to the human wrist, and then the metacarpus, or the pasterns, which are more similar to the long bones in our hands. So this skeletal um, structure is very similar to ours, and you don't have to know every part of your dog's skeletal structure, but it would be helpful in case there is a problem or your dog has an issue that you know some basic anatomy to be able to describe it to your vet. There may be times when you need to measure the height or the length of your dog. 
Height is officially measured from the point horizontal with the withers, remember that's where the shoulder, shoulders come up on your dog, straight down to the ground. If you need to measure the length of your dog, you do it from the point of the shoulder, which is the very front of your dog's chest, all the way to the point of the buttock, which is at the rear of your dog. And you may need to know your dog's height and length if you're getting a new uh, carrier or a new crate for your dog, because you want to make sure the dog has a room to move around in there. Let's talk a little bit about knowing your breed. It is helpful to know what breed your dog is or the breed it most closely resembles. We know that many of us have dogs that may be of uh, mixed breeds or that we adopted from the pound and we really don't know their breed. So it's helpful to try to find out what our dog most closely resembles. And knowing the breed characteristics can help you know how big your dog will get. Just in case you um, adopted your dog as a puppy, you need to know how big this dog may get huge, right? and if it has any potential hereditary defects, or what kind of personality your dog may have. Potential hereditary defects may be that your dog is more prone to having breathing problems based on the shape of the face and the skull of your dog. Uh, we know that some breeds have more eye problems as they get older. We know that some breeds have more hip and uh, joint problems based on the way the dog is made. So if you know a little bit about your dog's breed ahead of time, you can understand um, anything about the size, the personality, and potential problems your dog may have. Let's talk just a little bit for fun about the top 10 breeds in the United States. And if you've been around a lot of dogs and your friends and family, none of these should surprise you. The number one dog in the U.S. is the Labrador Retriever. Number two, German Shepherd. Number three, the Golden Retriever. Number four, the French Bulldog. Number five, Bulldogs. Number six is Poodles, all sizes. Number seven is the Beagle. Number eight is the Rottweiler. Number nine, the German Short-Haired Pointer. And rounding out the top ten, the Pembroke Welsh Corgi. And you may have some of these dogs in your family, or your dog may resemble one of these dogs. But you can tell some of the uh, top 10 breeds in the U.S. are some dogs that we know quite well. The American Kennel Club recognizes several breed groups. And if you're uh, one of those people who likes to watch the dog shows when they come on TV, you, you'll recognize some of these breed group names. The Sporting Group, the Hound Group, the Working Group, the Terrier Group, the Toy Group, the non sparting Group, and the Herding Group. And if you'd like to learn more about specific dog breeds within each of these groups, you can visit the AKC website for more information. But we're going to briefly describe each of the sporting groups to you, and this may help you determine if your dog would be closely resembled some of the dogs in these groups. Let's start with the sporting group. These were bred to assist hunters in the capture and retrieval of feathered game. Retrievers who were built for swimming specialize on waterfowl, while the hunting grounds of setters, spaniels, and pointing breeds are grasslands where quail, pheasant, and other game birds nest. Many breeds in this group possess thick water repellent coats resistant to the harsh hunting conditions. Some breeds you're going to know include the Labrador Retriever, the German Short-Haired Pointer, and the Cocker Spaniel. Let's move to the Hound Group. This group they were bred to pursue warm-blooded quarry. The sleek, long-legged sighthounds use explosive speed and wide vision to chase swift prey like jackrabbits and antelope while tough, durable scent hounds rely on their powerful noses to trail anything from raccoons to escaped convicts. Members of this group possess strong prey drives and often will stop at nothing to catch their quarries. Breeds you're going to recognize include the Bloodhound, the Dachshund, and the Greyhound. Next up is the Working Group. 
breeds in this group are dog kinds, punch the clock, blue collar workers. And the groups also include some of the world's most ancient breeds. They were developed to assist humans in some capacity, including pulling sleds and carts, guarding flocks and homes, and protecting their families. And many of these breeds are still used as working dogs today. These breeds tend to be known for imposing stature, strength, and their intelligence. Some breeds you may know include the Boxer, the Great Dane, and the Rottweiler. Up next is the Terrier group. The feisty short-legged breeds in the Terrier group were first bred to go underground in pursuit of rodents and other vermin. The long-legged terrier breeds dig out varmints rather than burrowing in after them. Many breeds are popular companion dogs today. And some breeds you're going to recognize include the Bull Terrier, the Scottish Terrier, and the West Highland White Terrier. Oh, up next is the Toy Group. The diminutive breeds come in enough coat types and colors to satisfy nearly any preference, but all are small enough to fit comfortably in the lap of their adored humans. In a way, toy dogs, toy dogs are their own version of working dogs. They work hard at being attentive and affectionate companions. Breeds are popular with sweaty city dwellers as their small size makes them a good fit for smaller yards or apartments. Some breeds you're going to recognize include the Chihuahua, the Pug, and the Shizu. Let's look at the non-sporting group. The breeds have two things in common, wet noses and four legs. After that, there's not much shared by this patchwork group of breeds whose job descriptions defy categorization in the six other groups, though they all have fascinating histories. Today, the varied breeds of the non-Spartan group are largely sought after as companion animals, as they were all developed to interact with people in some capacity. You're going to recognize these breeds, the Bulldog, the Dalmatian, and the Poodle. And finally, the herding group. This compromise comprises breeds developed for moving livestock, including sheep, cattle, and even reindeer. Herding dogs work closely with their human shepherds, and their natural intelligence and responsiveness makes them highly trainable. Today, some herding breeds, such as the German Shepherd, are commonly trained for police work. The high levels of energy found in the herding group means finding them a job is recommended. Or they may start hurting kids at your house or even people in your family. Breeds you're gonna recognize include the Border Collie, the German Shepherd, and the Pembroke Welsh Corgi. So as we wrap up our anatomy and breeds lesson, I'm gonna leave you with an at-home activity. Try to find out what breed your dog is or what breed it closely resembles. Learn about that breed. This will help you with potential health problems, the personality of your breed, and how big it's going to get. And always, if you have questions about your dog, be sure to visit with your veterinarian. They're there as a resource to help you learn more about your dog and how to take the best care possible of your faithful companion.